So since nobody knows me, I had to put all that information in my bio just so you know who I am. But it's funny, before I started, I picked the name of this talk before I picked the image for the icon of formation. And so my community said, just make sure everybody knows that you are not holding yourself up as the icon of formation. <laughs> and I, said, I hope that's pretty obvious, but just in case. I was actually going to choose Father Sean, but you wouldn't believe how much they're charging for the license. <laughs> so I found another picture that I'll show you at the end. Something that Carrie said yesterday really struck me about the mystery that we're living, having reverence for the mystery. And it made me realize that it's exactly 17 years ago today that I was sitting in the chapel in Cheshire, Connecticut, on my first retreat ever as a college student, when I realized that Jesus Christ is real. He's a real person. He wants my heart, and my choices matter to him. It was revolutionary for me. And looking at everybody here today makes me think about a quote from a British politician. I live in Washington, D.C. My community is very politically oriented. <laughs> so we talk a lot about politics there. And there's a British politician who at the beginning of the 20th century said that being born into the British Empire is like winning first place in the lottery of life. Now you'd probably argue with that statement. Our founding fathers argued with it in 1775. But looking at everybody here makes me think of another application that I can't argue with which is that being called to Regnum Christi really is like winning first place, for me personally, in the lottery of life. And I thought about that a lot. Why did God call me here? Why did Christ choose that it would be here in Regnum Christi that I would come to know him and love him? I don't know. I have no idea, but he knows why. And I think each one of us has a story like that of God's mercy, where he found us, he called us, and called us to Regnum Christi. So in the summer of 2000, I joined the candidacy. And I was there for a couple of months, just kind of half in, half out. I was sort of thinking, okay, I'll go here for a couple of months. God can tell me he doesn't want me to be a legionary, and then I'll go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember one night, a priest gave a talk. And he was talking about sincerity. And he said, you've got to take responsibility for your own life. And you've got to be sincere with God. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm not being sincere with God. I've got to give him everything. I've got to take responsibility for that. So I joined the novitiate in response to God's call. And then I started eating up the formation that we got there. I mean, a spiritual formation, adoration every day, spiritual direction every week. It was unbelievable learning how to pray. And then the intellectual formation, we're studying sacred scripture, we're studying the catechism, we're studying Latin, we're studying Greek. I love that. Our human formation. Forming these virtues, like sincerity, like loyalty, like honesty, all these things I didn't really think about much in college, starting to form. And then even just the, the PE class, we used to have PE every day in the division. And it was, I loved it. I was looking forward to it. I actually told one of the other novices that I was waiting for it to start. I was looking forward to it. And he said, are you crazy? <laughs> it turns out that our PE instructor was a former army ranger. <laughs> He had us doing like 100 push-ups at a time. I was doing like 90 on my knees, but still 100 push-ups. <laughs> and you're doing sit-ups and flutter kicks, but your stomach feels like it's going to burst. But I love you. I was forming my will. It's something I'd never really done before. Well, maybe in sports a little bit, but I had never seen it from a supernatural perspective. And then apostolically, I was sent to teach CCD to first graders. So imagine having to the Trinity to first graders. And not using a shamrock either, because that's actually a heresy. <laughs> so I loved it. But God had another step that he wanted to take in my life. So fast forward a few years, and I got sent on a summer fundraising road team. The legionaries who are here will know exactly what that means. You basically get $100, you get a plane ticket, you get a few days of training, and you get a list of about 1,500 names. People who have given money to us at some point in the past. And so the idea is that you go and you call them up and visit them and thank them and then see if they want to continue supporting the legionaries. And it's funny because that was basically our survival kit, like Father Sean was talking about this morning. But there's one thing in that survival kit that we didn't get. We didn't get the pepper spray. <laughs> there's a reason for it because you have two seminarians in a car together, eight hours a day, spending all your time together. I think we would use the pepper spray on each other. <laughs> so I remember that moment when it seemed like all this formation that I had, I had 
received that I had formed, it seemed like it was kind of falling apart on me. Because spiritually, I did not want to be there. I was seething inside. Because my whole community was going on vacation. They were going to be in New Hampshire, first of all. So like went up to Saki, the White Mountains up there, that awesome gym. And then they were going to Vermont after that, which is even better. Lake Champlain, it's just steeped in history there. It's an hour away from where I grew up. It's half an hour from the birthplace and the home of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. <laughs> they give you free samples whenever you go there. <laughs> so, chunky monkey ice cream was just cool. <laughs> Here I was in this chunky 1995 Ford Taurus in the sun baked fields of Kansas, which is a beautiful state. I came to the But at first, I was struggling there. And then intellectually, I couldn't understand why was God asking me to do this? I had just spent a year studying Latin, Greek, Herodotus, Thucydides, all those guys Father Bruce was quoting last night. And now he's asking me to go call people to see if I can visit them, and I'm getting hung up on a lot. So what's, where's the intellectual formation leading there? And then humanly, it was really difficult. The seminarian that I was with, who's actually here now, he's a priest, but his anonymity will be protected. <laughs> but he was a great example for me, actually. He was so patient. But after a while, you're just together all the time, and you start to see all the cracks and all the flaws in yourself. And I remember once, we were in Kansas City, and our car broke down in Overland Park, so somebody's front lawn there. And we went to the airport and rented another car illegally, because neither of us was 25. But I guess all that formation helped us to convince them that we were of their trust. We didn't get insurance on it. And then we leave the airport, and 15 minutes later, we're driving merrily through the streets of Kansas City, and we run a red light and crash into somebody else's car. Oh. Luckily, she didn't sue. Otherwise, I think I'd be wearing an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> but it was just so hard. And I remember getting really frustrated with this other seminarian. I've never told him this, but we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> I was really frustrated with him. And it came out once, I remember we had a fight about whether to eat at a Sonic or a Subway. <laughs> so, looking back on that whole experience, which was actually a great grace from God. <laughs> but looking back on it, I think what had happened is I had started to see my formation as something kind of outside in, something I was doing for myself and to myself. Almost maybe kind of like making a pizza. So you got a pizza here with the four sections, and you got your feta cheese, you got your tomatoes there, you got your guacamole, and you got your indeterminate <laughs> substance over there. <laughs> but I was kind of making these four different areas of formation, but I lost sight of the, the core of all of that, the center of all of that. I was making a pizza, and the pizza was burning on me. But then I read something from William Butler Yeats, his poem called The Second Coming. And it really struck me. So he wrote it in 1919, after the rise of communism in Russia. And he says, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. I said, that's what my life feels like. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. And I was trying to find an image that would be relevant for us today, when things fall apart, when the center cannot hold. And that, that phrase, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, actually gave me. <laughs> But then I read something else from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. In chapter 1, he has this line that we're all familiar with. He says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Actually, in Greek, he says the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And to use the technical theological expression, that rocked my world, really, to read that. <laughs> in him, all things hold together. This is what we're talking about, the Christ-centered formation. It's in him that all things hold together. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> that 
have to send it. <laughs> Think about St. Paul's spiritual autobiography in Galatians 2.20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I live now not I, but Christ Jesus lives in me. And we all share that spiritual autobiography by our own baptism, as Mike brought out so beautifully in that first talk today. So this is why St. Augustine, for example, would say, Deus intimior intimo meo. God is more inward than my inmost self. That's why we have this image of him, all things hold together. That's why St. Paul will say in Galatians 4, 6, because we are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's why I'll say in Romans 5, 5, that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. In Romans 8, 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We can go on and on and on with these quotes. This is the word of God for us. So if all of this is true, then that must mean that formation is an inside-out process of transformation. St. John Paul II would say that formation is actually this gradual path of identification with the inner attitudes of the Son towards the Father. So you would say it's actually God the Father through the Holy Spirit forming the attitudes of Christ within us. And think about what this means for us in our own lives. This is really exciting because it means that all of our own efforts, which are so important in our formation, are just a response to something that God is already doing within us. This is one of my favorite pictures of St. John Paul II here. This was in uh, Rio in 1979 when he visited. This little girl just broke the crowd barrier, just ran over to him, crying. And so he just hugged her, quieted her down. But just the look on his face really struck me. This is an inside-out transformation. This is formation. This is what the Lord wants to bring us to, each in our own way. A great example of this, I think, this inside-out transformation, how this works, is the Samaritan woman, tomorrow's gospel. So think about what happened. She's there at the well, and Christ first begins a relationship with her. He dialogues with her. He speaks with her. So there's a spiritual formation that's taking place there. And then you have the intellectual formation, you could say. Her mind, her heart, her will, everything starts to open up to the Lord. She starts to have this, this loving vision. She starts to share God's vision. So she's asking, she's asking questions now about theology, about the Messiah. And then you have the human formation. I'm willing to bet that this woman's emotions were pretty chaotic. I mean, think about it. She'd been married five times. She's living with a guy now who's not her husband. She goes to the well at midday because she's so ashamed. She won't go at another time, so nobody will see her. And you see over the course of this dialogue with the Lord how little by little her emotions and her passions are starting to come into line, too. They're starting to be formed by this relationship. And then the apostolic dimension. She's an apostle. She goes back to the town. And she says, come and meet this man. Just come and meet him. Could he be the Messiah? She's saying, come and meet somebody who's changed my life. It's not the same to know him as not to know him. Come and meet him. That's the apostolic dimension right there. And now finally we come to the true icon of formation. Who is, of course, Christ. So every icon is constructed the face of every icon is constructed on four concentric circles. So just imagine the first circle right in here. Sorry, my hands are shaking. That's why I didn't become a neurosurgeon. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there in between the eyes. And that's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's small, it's almost imperceptible. Think about the image that Christ will use in tomorrow's gospel. And he tells a Samaritan woman, the water that I will give you will be like a spring welling up to eternal life. The water is the Holy Spirit. But that image is really interesting. A spring. He doesn't say it's going to be like Victoria Falls, you know, just gushing all over the place. He doesn't say it's going to be like the Mississippi River when it floods its banks. It's going to be a spring. Tiny, silent, gentle, imperceptible. How do we know it? By its effects. Whenever you see a spring, you see the ground around it is green. And ultimately, that can become a river. So that's the first circle. And that's the circle from which everything else flows, is that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The second circle 
whoops, is right here. So it's the forehead and the eyes. That first circle, you could say, is our spiritual formation, the dialogue with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord. The second is intimately related to it. That's our intellectual formation. So that stands for our mind, our heart, our will, the spiritual faculties where we come to have this loving vision of God. And this is where it's so important to study and to learn. Like St. Peter says, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. But it's always as a response to something the Lord has already done with us. Just like with the Samaritan woman, she discovered that she was in a healed relationship. She wasn't left alone with her sin. She discovered mercy. And that brought her to this formation in the different areas of her life. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you have the mind of Christ. That's really the purpose of all our intellectual formation. Then the third circle is the whole face. So the hair, since it's Christ here, the beard as well. And this stands for our human formation. So the formation of the passions, the formation of the emotions. All those things that help us to become a bridge between Christ and others, rather than an obstacle for the bridge. And also you'll notice that the mouth on an icon is always very prominent. The lips are prominent. And with that, they want to show that also the body is redeemed, too. That the whole person is redeemed. You might remember that line from Chariots of Fire, where Eric Little is talking to his sister. So he's an Olympic runner, and he's also a missionary. And his sister is just berating him, because he's running in the Olympics. And she said, God made you to be a missionary. You should be in China. And he said, I know, God made me to be a missionary. And he said, I'm going to go to China after the Olympics. But God also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. It's also part of our human formation. Everything that God's given to us. And then we have the halo. And this is our apostolic formation here. This indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Your grace. Or your His grace. Permeates our whole life. It begins to transform us as we cooperate with it through our own efforts. Turning into the intellectual formation, the human formation. And the apostolic formation is this indwelling that becomes a light perceptible to others. This is why we go out. This is the love of Christ that impels us. First, it's his love for us within us. Through this indwelling of the Holy Spirit that impels us to go out. We have to tell others about this. We have to share. Just come and meet this person that's changed my life. And all of this brings us, I think, to a tremendous freedom and a tremendous responsibility. Tremendous responsibility because the Lord asks us to be responsible, to really to take our own formation seriously, to use all the means that he's given to us. And in Regnum Christi, we have some fabulous means for formation. So he asks us to take it seriously to do the best that we can, to try to become everything that he's calling us to be, but knowing that it's a response to his grace. G.K. Chesterton, supposedly, said that being a Christian changes everything, even the way that you brush your teeth. <laughs> and so there is a call to that excellence, but as a response to the Lord's love. And knowing that he works in ways that we could never imagine, even through some of the fundraising road teams, and he'll bring us <laughs> to a deeper relationship with him. So there's that responsibility but there's also tremendous freedom. There's a beautiful line from T.S. Eliot's poem, Little Gidding, when he says, For us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. And so as we strive, as we form ourselves as a response to the Lord's love, I think that we can all paraphrase what St. Paul says in Philippians 2.12. We can say, let's work out our formation." with effort and dedication, because it is God himself who is at work in us, both to work and to desire. Thank you.